I can't believe it's already March deer chore time and I can't believe it's that time of the year. It's uh, it just crazy how the time flies by. And every month there's something to do with whitetails when it comes to deer hunting and deer habitat work, even deer management. So we're covering all those every month. And we'll just dive right into it. Number one, um, March to me is a great time to shed hunt. Now, when you're up north and the deer are dropping their antlers the end of uh, December, early January, then, and if there's no snow, then of course getting into the woods a little bit earlier is, is uh, certainly appropriate. But a lot of areas where there's mixed ag, and then you get further south where you're getting into big wooded areas in Kentucky, southern Ohio, southern Indiana, Mich or Illinois, um, even portions of Iowa where it's not mixed ag, then you still, because of the warmer climate and less stress on deer, they're dropping those antlers. Uh, later in the past people talk about that um, you know it was all depends on the light uh, when those deer are losing the antlers but what studies have shown what people have found is if you have supplementary field fed deer in a in a one mile enclosure and you have the wild deer on the outside those supplementary pellet fed deer will drop their antlers sometimes two to three months later than those deer that are on the outside of the fence same climate same snowfall, same temperatures. The only difference is the food. And a lot of times in those enclosure areas, all the uh, cover's been browsed out, so there's even not as much cover. But when they're pellet fed, or when they're supplementally fed, then that really helps them hold through the winter in a lot greater condition, and they drop their antlers a lot later. And that's why overall, March is a great time to shed hunt. And we're still waiting for our snow to melt. We tried shed hunting uh, this last weekend. It was the 27th, 28th of February. And there's still some areas, 16, 18 inches of wet, nasty snow that we'd fall through. Other areas were exposed. We found four sheds on Sunday just walking around in our cornfield. But in the end, though, you know, we're talking about deer work that's going to make you a better hunter. I haven't found that finding sheds actually makes you a better hunter that much. Um, people say, yeah, we've, we have these sheds to this buck. We unraveled the mystery to this buck, but they found the sheds over on neighbor's land a mile away during the winter time because the land that they hunted didn't have uh, fall cover or winter cover, winter food, and they were only on their land during the fall. They're dropping their antlers a mile away. We've had that happen. There was a guy named Paul. He was from Minnesota when we were in Wisconsin, and he would find the sheds of the bucks that we shot, and it was roughly a mile and a half to two miles away. They would summer there. They would winter there. They would drop their antlers, but then we'd shoot them in the fall. You want to be the person shooting them in the fall. So a lot of times where antlers fall doesn't necessarily mean that's where those bucks are going to be in the fall. So you always has, have to ask why. Ask why with anything. Bucks bedded here in the fall. Why is he bedded there in the fall? Not during the summer and then not during the winter. You'll find major seasonal changes from where bucks bed from spring to summer to fall to winter. And you'll find less change, even a fraction of that change, when it comes to does and fawns. So always ask why. When it comes to shed hunting, shed hunting's fun. It's a family fun time. It's great time with friends. It's a social time. It's great exercise. It helps you get to know the lay of your land a little bit, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But um, kind of be realistic with the shed hunting. You know, when it comes to finding out strategy of bucks, that takes place of the movements that take place and October, November, December, even January, not necessarily February, March, and April. Those deer could be long gone, not using those same trails, bedding areas, and food sources. And uh, so try to put things in perspective. Always think about you know what's going on in my land as it relates to how I can hunt and how I can hunt these deer. And bottom line, when it comes to shed hunting, if you have a good trail cam strategy and we rely on our mock scrapes, we feel that we get a picture of 95% or greater of every buck in the entire area within a mile of our property. There's very few random bucks. If you're doing it correctly, you should rarely have random bucks. I've seen studies out there where they'll say, well, 50% of the bucks we recognize. Folks, that's really, really bad. That's on a random property where you're pushing deer around, probably a poor hunting strategy. You should really recognize 90, 90, 90 to 95% of all the bucks you get pictures of. Your trail camera should tell you if those bucks are alive. We've been getting trail camera pictures of Venti. I'd like to find his sheds. And uh, we just saw another one this morning. Uh, Dylan, I think it was February 6th. Um, I would love to find Venti's sheds. I'm not saying I wouldn't like to find them, but 
where those sheds are at will probably have little to no value from where we're hunting them in the fall. We already have our hunting strategy for Venti coming this, this uh, fall. We already know he's alive. So finding a shed or not isn't gonna make a hill of beans difference for when we actually try to shoot him this hunting season, which we're hoping to have a really good uh, look at him, a uh, close look, like bow shot close look um, this fall. Now, number two, uh, bedding and TSI work. Now, I encourage you to be in the woods uh, from the end of deer season all the way till about three, four weeks before the deer season begins. Whatever you do out in the woods does not matter. What I like about shed hunting during March, what I like about uh, bedding and TSI work during March is that it's a non-invasive time. If you go spook deer, it really doesn't matter. It's not gonna affect your hunt one way. The only time it does affect strategy or management goals is if you wanna find those sheds and you're out doing habitat work in January, February, March, and those bucks haven't dropped their antlers, Yes, they do like to come in and browse on those tops and debris sometimes, but those mature bucks, once you push them a few times and you're going out in the woods and they leave your land, people can say, well, they like logging activity and they do, but not consistent logging activity. I've seen deer leave for months at a time, logging work on a property we used to hunt. They logged all the way up till early October and it pushed the deer away severely for November. They didn't come back till December, January. Most of the time they didn't come back to the following year. So even logging activities will push mature bucks away. Don't go by the reaction of does and fawns and young bucks, whether it comes to logging, ATV use, hiking, trail use. You can't look at those lesser deer as far as the reaction to pressure and apply that to mature bucks. Completely different. So what I like about March, if you want to find those sheds, you wait to do the bedding work till March, and then the sap is flowing too. We have uh, good friends, uh, Zach and, and Laura uh, uh, Scoville. They're out and they're tapping trees right now for syrup and, and getting that sap flowing. And when we have these freezing temperatures at night and it's getting up in the 40s during the day, that's a perfect time. And it's also a perfect time for you to hinge cut. Bedding and TSI work. Completely different if you look at the two, and we'll just mention this real quick. This is a 40 acre property plan, just made it up in my head, put it out there. Food plots are green, red areas of specific bedding. There's a swamp over here in this corner, deer routes, deer travel, and those dots moving around. And then this big area in the middle of black, and that is the TSI work. Unfortunately, TSI doesn't always equal white tail work. So when you're in the woods this time of year working, you're thinking about making sure that you have the regeneration of lesser timber and low value timber. That could be, you're really keen on cutting aspen completely, no hinge cuts. Ash, you can hinge cut or not. Maple, you can hinge cut or not. Most oak, you can hinge cut or not. Hickory, you can hinge cut or not. Conifers, you don't hinge cut. Bottom line is uh, most of the time cherry, you're not hinge cutting either. Um, but bottom line is you're looking at this TSI area that's a wildlife uh, timber stand improvement, not necessarily timber stand improvement. Um, if you're trying to increase boards per foot, you know, go find another channel. This is for wildlife. And it's not that you can't do the same. In this area, maybe that would be appropriate because you have a lot of hard maple you have to manage or hardwoods in general, cherry, oak. You're, you're completing a select cut on that entire area. You're opening up the canopy 20%, 30%. You're allowing sunlight to come in. I'd prefer to see 40, 50%. But sometimes when you have those high dollar timber, you kind of strap yourself short for wildlife improvement and you end up slanting more towards timber production because you don't want to waste the resource. That's why I'm happy we don't have a lot of hardwood timber out here that is marketable that we need to even worry about. I can cut wherever I want and I don't really care about the timber value. There's not much out there and I don't care about having it in 20, 30 years. We bought this for wildlife and that's what i want to apply to this area i'm opening up the canopy if i can 40 to 50 percent those larger trees six eight inches or older i'm dropping down getting sunlight to the ground and then when i get into some of these really specific bedding areas that might be an acre two acres at the most i'm cutting that large timber down that's going to accomplish 80 percent of the goal if i have that mature timber putting a lot of sunlight on the ground over 50 percent at least and then I'm taking and I'm hinge cutting those trees that are three to six inches in diameter, sometimes eight. The sap's flowing so they're not gonna snap and break. I'm using a hinge cut tool and I'm cutting those trees on top of the mature trees to complement the horizontal cover in the area. And then I'm putting more brows at head level. Again, you're never hinge cutting high unless it's on a hill and you're blocking. Those are extreme circumstances. And I don't recommend that unless you're highly skilled to do so. Uh, so you don't cut your face in half with a chainsaw. Hinge cuts are appropriate. 
when you have that timber size. March is a great time to hinge cut again because you're not snap, snapping uh, those trees and wasting the resource. And it can be a great one-two punch for getting canopy removed and then getting those hinge cuts down. And again, those hinge cuts are cut at waist level so the deer can actually feed on those hinge cuts and actually experience side cover and cover in general so they're not looking under those hinge cuts they can actually reach the food in these red areas this would be timber stand improvement you might have to select cut the woods if you're if you have a lot of hardwood or maybe you can do like i do and i'm cutting a certain percentage every 40 50 yards of mature timber to get to sunlight to the ground and then i'm focusing on these red areas those are more of a clear cut those are if you had a logger coming out you're saying i want these one or two acre pockets completely clear cut that's where I expect high quality bedding. I might go in there and add 50 to 100 trees of conifer per acre clustered in two to five trees scattered evenly around that so that you have cluster over here, 20, 30 feet to cluster over here, 20, 30 feet. And it could be two to five trees up to 10 trees and they're tightly spaced four to six feet in the woods. I'm looking at white spruce, white pine or some shade tolerant tree. Uh, red cedar is not bad if you're going to get sun on it. That's where I would focus on hinge cutting more. And again, if those trees are six to eight inches or smaller in diameter, then it's going to be all hinge cut. And I want to make sure there's no dead ends that the deer can move all the way through it. So if I'm cutting down, down those areas myself, I make sure the deer can move it, move through it. If a logger is removing those trees, just have them move everything. Keep Always keep the the unwanted logs and tops and debris so that you immediately have side cover and that'll also cage some of your growth coming in too in those areas. Great time to do so again in March because the sap's flowing. You can get an explosion of growth. There's still a lot of energy in the root system so when it comes time for leaf out you can experience an explosion of growth whether those trees are growing out of the stumps or they're growing out of the side of the tree with hinge cuts. Number three, lay of the land. This is an outstanding time, especially in, we're in Minnesota right now, it's March 1st. March is a great time to figure out your lay of the land, especially when you're in hill country. Uh, we've been really fortunate, it's March 1st right now, so we have a lot of snow showing. We were shed hunting this last weekend, got into some areas of the property I've never seen before. Again, I'm probably down to where I've seen 30% of the property in a lot of the area, and there's 70% that I need to walk and look around a lot. So when I'm looking at this in the snow, and there's still snow on the ground, you can see every nook and cranny. Snow can be a really valuable, um, asset at this time of the year for figuring out your lay of the land. When I'm out shed hunting, you know, it's really hard to focus on sheds and high strategy where you're looking at, okay, these deer trails go through. I'm determining where I can actually access and shoot deer and add tree stands. I'm looking for trails in those areas. I like seeing those X's of movement, but random rubs and scrapes. I know people that go mark every rub and scrape on their land, and that's really um, an effort and futility a lot of times because it's not leading. You don't care. I don't care what some of those rubs are in this general area and scrapes. I want to find out the edges, the benches. I want to create bedding areas and TSI, but that's a different practice in shed hunting. Right now allows me to go in the woods. I don't really care about spooking deer. It's months away before the season, and I can figure out my lay of the land. Every little bench, saddle, point ridge system ditch hollow really sticks out and like a lot of times you can sit and just look at the lay of land so pretty easy when you're shed hunting just to look around and you know enjoy your property and figure out where those deer might be bedding where you can improve those bedding areas or improve your tsi later in the year but a great time to do this without bugs without mosquitoes without leaves and without vegetation everything's great to see right now now number four when we get into april uh, last year, I sprayed 18, 19 acres in three properties, three, three uh, locations, two states, uh, three times. And so for food plots and switchgrass, really worked hard um, to get those going. And it seems like every year, if I start the year and I haven't, you know, I'm planning on doing this on Saturday, that's when we figure out the uh, sprayer leaks. Or that's when we figure out we need to replace a hose or a pump doesn't work for whatever reason. So great time to do that now so you can be efficient later. And that can apply to your chainsaws and everything, your uh, spreader. We have, uh, you know, I like to tell people I use an earthway spreader. We're not sponsored by them in any way, but we have four boxes of earthway spreader in the pole building. So we're all ready to go for our frost seeding coming up. And then certainly when it comes time to spray, uh, we'll be all set and ready to go too. And this is a great time to do so. 
make sure you maintain your equipment and and really i mean it seems like it's been so cold lately we have a lot of snow on the ground but it's march 1st and we'll be spraying by the middle of april so that's going to be coming here it could be early april depending on the spring um, so it's not too far away and finally number five trail cameras last fling and what I mean by that is my trail cameras are out in the woods for all but about two to three months of the year. They've been out since June, July last year. We start by adding them on mock scrapes, vertical scrapes. We're starting to take inventory and we can see the growth of bucks. I can guarantee if we see Venti growing this year, the end of May, June, we'll know it's him. And so that's when I like getting those trail cameras out. I take them out of the woods typically the end of March. So April, May, they're out of the woods. And, uh, and so we, Dylan and I just went around uh, the trail cameras I have right now that are taking video footage. We have good batteries in. That's where we just saw one from uh, Venti just about three weeks ago, two weeks ago. And, uh, and then we'll pick up those. We wanna see, uh, there's always bucks around here that are still holding in early April. So we'll see which ones are still holding. It seems like most of them have dro already dropped their antlers. We're seeing a lot of shed bucks in the, in the video, especially that we looked at today. Big difference over two weeks. Uh, Diane, it was about two and a half weeks ago, she saw eight bucks right by the house here that was still holding, including Venti. They were 40 yards away from the house. She watched them from the upstairs windows. Uh, pretty cool. We're making sure our trail cameras are pretty good right now. Um, I think I have batteries in all of them, new batteries. And uh, we've had new batteries since, let's say October, November, and those will last all the way until uh, we pull them out in April and then we'll get them back in the woods. So. There's some March chores that you can do. I hope they all make sense. Um, we're always working um, on the whitetail. This is what we do. And I know not all of you have time to be in the woods every month of the year. But if you do, this is what we're doing. And this is what I do to be successful. And, and really, I'm trying to let you know the priority of events so that when you get to each month, you kind of have a game plan going in so you can be efficient with your time. And I want to end this too. I really appreciate you guys watching. Um, you and YouTube, your, the community that we have is incredible. The comments, um, I'm not even going to try to name names, but I see some of the same comments all the time. YouTube let me know that I, that I answered 27,000 comments last year. That was a combination of likes, loves, and comments. I've probably written comments 8 to 10,000 somewhere on there. I appreciate those. Keep them coming. I can't answer them all. And so because of that, what we're trying to do is we're going to have more of a call-in format. We're actually shooting three call-ins today where people have specific questions about habitat or deer hunting. Dylan and I will sit here. You in the frame? Yeah, and I'm in this time. <laughs> Dylan and I will sit here. We'll have them on speaker so we could listen, and we'll create some videos that way. I'm going to open up on social media. Make sure you're following me on Instagram. Especially in order priority, I hit YouTube first, Instagram, and then if there's time, I hit Facebook. Um, and that's based on the number of people that can see the answers in discussion and benefit the most because ultimately I want to help you the most. That's why I never answer questions by email. Um, I simply do not have time, especially when it's a discussion with one person, uh, especially when I visit 100 clients a year and create all these videos. I just don't have time. And so um, social media is important. I really appreciate you guys. And I'll have some notices on social media that let you know, hey, we're going to be filming this day. We want to know what questions people have. And again, we're going to pick questions based on not some little small segment of how do you manage big blue stem and it doesn't apply to most people or we even recommend it. Um, instead, it'll be a question that helps the most people. Again, I'm trying to help as many people as possible. We'll pick those questions and for being on the show and on that YouTube channel, then we'll send you one of our WHS hats. It says it actually says exclusive on the back right here. Mine doesn't, so my, I'm not exclusive. <laughs> I'm not important enough, but we appreciate you guys. And for being on the show, we'll send those hats out to you. We'll let you know when that's coming down the pipe. And Dylan and I will be in on that discussion with you. And we look forward to that. Thank you very much and enjoy your March. There's a lot you can do right now that'll benefit you later on during the fall. Now, as we transition into habitat season, I hope you've had a chance to check out my web class, how to design your web, your whitetail parcel. It's on my website, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I have a link in the description, and I hope you can find it, check it out, and enjoy it this year.